Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's March 2024, and you're listening to Episode 382, which is a pod blast, a shorter episode than usual, and our conversation today is about refuting determinism, which is noted in our article based on this podcast as, quote, the belief that God so arranges the affairs of the universe that everything and anything that ever happens is efficaciously orchestrated by God so that it must have happened exactly as it did, end quote. Today's guest is Clay Jones. He is a visiting scholar for the Master's in Apologetics program at Talbot Seminary. He's also the chairman of the board of Ratio Christi, which is a university apologetics ministry. Clay has written an online feature article that's quite in-depth. It's a viewpoint article about determinism. Our viewpoint articles address relevant contemporary issues in discernment and classical apologetics, theological debates like this one, Christian ethics, and cultural apologetics from a particular perspective that's not usually shared by all Christians. So we hope that our listeners thinking on these viewpoint issues will be stimulated and enhanced whether or not you end up agreeing with the author. And we have some older point-counterpoint articles on this same issue of the sovereignty of God, which we will link in the show notes if you would like to see another counterpoint to Clay's view. Clay's article is called, Is Determinism Biblical? And you can read it for free online at our website, equip.org. Hi, Clay. It's great to have you back on the podcast again. So first of all, I want to ask you, what is determinism, which your article notes is something that is held by Calvinists, and why, in your opinion, is it a concern? Thanks for having me on, Melanie. It's always a pleasure. Divine determinism, also known as compatibilism, something I explain in my article, is that God so arranges the affairs of the universe that everything and anything that ever happens is efficaciously orchestrated by God so that it must have to happen exactly as it did. Augustus Toplady put it in the perspective, not a dust flies in a beaten road, but God raises it, conducts its uncertain motion, and by his particular care conveys it to the certain place he had before appointed for it. Did everyone get that? Every particle of dust lands exactly where God ordains it to land. This determinism extends to every thought and every deed of every person. As determinist John Frame put it, God controls all things, inanimate creatures, the detailed course of nature, events of history, human lives, free human decisions, and even human sins. In other words, if determinism is true, then you can never do other than you do, ever. Also, every decision that you've ever made was such that you couldn't have decided whether good or bad to decide otherwise. It's important to point out that there are two logically possible extremes. One logically possible extreme is that God determines nothing. The other logically possible extreme is that God determines everything. Now, there are no Christians, not one who believes that God determines nothing. The number of Christians who believe that God determines nothing is zero, nada, zip, zilch, nothing. There's no one. On the contrary, all Christians believe that God determines many things. For instance, all Christians believe that God determined who would be an apostle. All Christians believe that God determined that Paul would encounter Christ on the Damascus Road. All Christians believe that God determined that Jesus would die on the cross. All Christians believe that God determined the sun would rise, that water runs downhill, that healthy humans would have brains that work, and so on and on. In fact, I, as a non-determinist, also known as a libertarian, I explain that more in the article, 
believe that God determines the large majority of things that happen on planet Earth. This is important because those new to this discussion often think that non-determinists believe that God determines nothing. That's not correct. Again, non-determinists, also, as I said, known as libertarians, believe that God determines many things, if not most things that happen in the universe. Non-determinists just don't believe that God determines absolutely everything so that no human can do other than they do. The other logical extreme is to believe that God determines absolutely everything. Every twitch of a caterpillar's leg, where every speck of dust will land, this also means that God determines every person's every thought, every deed, every desire, so that no person can do or desire other than they do. If this is true, then God determined every pornographic word that was ever written, every torture that was ever devised and employed, and every hideous murder that ever occurred so that the person who thought it up and perpetrated those evil deeds could not have not wanted to do those things and could not have not done them. In other words, getting rid of the double negatives, the perpetrator had the desire to do them, and then he had to do them because God so ordained the affairs of the universe that that would happen. If determinism is true, and God has determined every creature's every thought and deed so that they could never do otherwise, then the man who fantasized about he would how he would rape and torture to death the little girl next door and then actually carried out his wicked scheme was not able to do otherwise. This means that every exquisite torture, every penetration, burn, cut, crush, ad infinitum, ad nauseum, was indeed efficaciously arranged by God so that this torture could not have done other than he did. Thus, those who hold this view not only struggle to explain why God allows evil, most determines find it's impossible. It's no surprise then that determinist R.C. Sproul concluded, I do not know the solution to the problem of evil, nor do I know anyone else who does. Of course he doesn't. How can anyone explain why God would allow evil if God providentially makes every evil happen? So what do you think that determinism's emotional appeal is for some Christians? Over the years, I've learned that for some Christians, determinism has strong emotional appeal. For example, one determinist wrote to me that if determinism wasn't true, then that would mean you're better than me. This fellow had abused drugs and basically destroyed his first marriage and family, but if determinism is true, then he couldn't have not done those things. Because it was all for the glory of God, the Lord had, for some reason, arranged the affairs of the universe that he would do those things. Frankly, I was shocked by his comment. It never occurred to me that someone would go, well, if determinism isn't true, that means you're better than me? Wow. I don't go around thinking, hey, I'm better than people because I didn't sin in this way or that. Oh, anyway, I was shocked by that comment. As I said, I reject determinism, but would never be thinking that I'm better than those who have led a life of sin before coming to Christ. But this person considered determinism the great equalizer. After all, if determinism is true, then any lack of success in any area, family, business, ministry, or whatever, whether real or imagined, was all the work of God controlling everything for his ultimate glory. But if determinism isn't true, then family, business, or ministry failures in our every sin could be seen as an individual person's fault. Remember that determinist John Frame put it that God is in control of, quote, even human sins, unquote. Thus, if a Christian spends a lust-filled night looking at hardcore pornography, then the Christian couldn't have not looked at hardcore porn on that occasion. Why not? Because God had so arranged the universe that his or her looking at porn was literally inevitable. It had to happen. Obviously, then, the Christian determinist's sense of guilt over personal sins may be mitigated because he or she believes that God has arranged the universe in such a way that he couldn't have or she couldn't have not sinned. You see, then, how determinism might have great emotional appeal. But Scripture always treats our sins as completely our fault and calls us to own up to what we've done wrong, confess it and repent of it, that is, make plans not to do it again. Scripture is always calling us to do that. The grace of God is there in abundance for those who come to Jesus just as they are without one plea. Finally, how do you answer those who believe that determinism is true? I'll make two major points. 
First, I like to ask the determinist, has there ever been one time when you've lusted as a Christian, whether after people, possessions, positions, or pleasures, that you could have not lusted, even one time? Determinists struggle greatly with this question. I wonder if the Holy Spirit within them isn't quietly urging them, don't you dare say that there hasn't been one time when you have sinned that you couldn't have not sinned. I've asked Talbot students, so if you look at hardcore pornography for four hours, then you couldn't have not looked at hardcore porn for four hours, right? And when I've asked them this kind of thing uh, in person, they've really struggled to answer the question to the point that they look like they were beginning to come undone. Now, a couple of times in, in a, on a Talbot forum, I've had determinists answer that, yes, if they looked at porn for four hours, then they couldn't have not looked at porn for four hours. And that's the honest, consistent answer. The, everything is under control by God. And even if you look at porn, in fact, now that you think about it, if, if determinism is true, every time, every porn shoot that ever happens, the way it's done, the way it's choreographed, God hasn't been in charge of all of that. He made it happen so that it couldn't have not happened. Anyway, but consider 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. After all, if God has determined every Christian's every sin so that no Christian could do otherwise, what is the way of escape from every and any sin? No one can escape from what God has determined. How can the verse say you will never be tempted, quote, beyond what you're able, unquote, if you could never do other than you do? How can any Christian ever resist any sin if God has previously determined that he or she would commit that sin? Does not this verse run contrary to determinism? Paul in 1 Corinthians 10.13 tells us that no cause or set of causes that encourage a Christian to sin is so strong that the Christian could not do otherwise, and yet Christians sometimes sin. One of my fit determinist students, uh, I had a lot of them, by the way, master students, and we argued all the time about this point, mostly on online forums, one of my determinist students could not answer 1 Corinthians 10, 13, but he retorted, but you can't build a doctrine on just one verse. So I immediately gave him another verse, Romans 6, verse 12 to 14. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as though who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of for righteousness, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. I then asked him if we were commanded not to yield our members to sin, which we were told would have no dominion over us, then how could we not sin on any particular occasion if God had determined that we would commit a sin on that particular occasion? If a man yields his eyes, that is, his members, to look at porn for four hours, and God has determined that he would do so, then he wasn't free from the dominion of sin on that occasion. I'm thankful to report that at this point he was finished. He no longer argued for determinism being true. But surely the most forced reading of every New Testament command and Old Testament command, for that matter, at least implies that when we sin, we could have not sinned. And that is the non-determinist position. Second, determinism undermines rationality. As William Lane Craig put it, universal causal determinism cannot be rationally affirmed. There's a sort of dizzying, self-defeating character to determinism. For if one comes to believe that determinism is true, one has to believe that the reason he came to that believe that it is simply was that he was determined to do so. One has not, in fact, been able to weigh the arguments pro and con and freely make up their mind on that basis. The difference between the person who weighs the arguments for determinism and rejects them and the person who weighs them and accepts them is wholly that one was determined by causal factors outside himself to believe and therefore the other not to believe. When you come to realize that your decision to believe in determinism was itself determined, 
and that your present realization of that fact right now is likewise determined. A sort of vertigo sets in, for everything that you think, even this very thought itself, is outside your control. Determinism could be true, but it's very hard to see how it could ever be rationally affirmed, since its affirmation undermines the rationality of its affirmation. Look, Bill's absolutely right. If determinism is true, then one cannot weigh scriptural evidence for it being true or not, and then, based on his or her understanding of the evidence, weigh the pros and cons and come to an independent conclusion. It's also weird that if determinism is true, then I, as a non-determinist, have been ordained by God to reject determinism. But I've been ordained by God so strenuously to argue against it. In short, determinism doesn't make logical sense. One more thing. Third, this makes many passages of Scripture almost, well, senseless, almost schizophrenic. I'll give one example here. Consider how Jesus' words would come out in Matthew 23, 37, if the determinist position were inserted, where Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to you, how often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But the, and here's how the determinist would have to add it. But the Father has efficaciously determined the affairs of the universe. Okay, there's the addition. The Father has efficaciously determined the affairs of the universe, so you were not willing. Does Jesus long for what he knows the Father has made impossible? There's many more examples like this in my article. Anyway, thank you, Melanie, for the opportunity to discuss this. You've been listening to a pod blast from the Postmodern Realities podcast from the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest was Dr. Clay Jones. He has written an online in-depth feature article entitled, Is Determinism Biblical? And you can read it for free on our website, equip.org. You won't want to miss out on subscribing to the other podcasts from the Christian Research Institute. We have the Bible Answer Man podcast, which is published Monday through Friday with the best of the week on Saturday. It's hosted by CRI President Hank Hanegraaff and is available wherever you get your favorite podcasts. In addition, Hank has a podcast called Hank Unplugged. Hank takes you out of the studio and into his study to engage in free-flowing, essential Christian conversations on critical issues with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people on the planet. And you won't want to miss out on the brand new podcast from the Christian Research Journal. Christian Research Journal Reads presents audio versions of Christian Research Journal articles it was a print incarnation of almost 45 years. It's now on the web, as you know, with new articles every single week. So you won't want to miss these audio articles of some of our most popular and most accessed articles on our website, equip.org.